uh, all of our audiences who have stayed connected to our program and especially to our speakers who uh, have seemed to pivot on a dime and uh, get accustomed rather quickly to um, addressing a screen rather than addressing a live audience. So thanks for joining us tonight. The presentation will run about 30 minutes, maybe a little longer, after which we'll have audience question and answers. Uh, uh, the program can be viewed tonight in its native habitat on Crowdcast, as well as on our Facebook and YouTube pages. To watch with closed captioning, go over to YouTube, where you can enable real-time captions with the uh, CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The video will also be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Uh, know that you'll have to submit your questions using the Ask a Question button on Crowdcast, and that we cannot guarantee that we'll be able to address everyone, but we'll get to as many as possible. Town Hall adds new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include the economist Stephanie Kelton on the myth of deficits and her blueprint for an economy centered around working people. Former Defense Secretary Robert Gates in conversation with General Pete Chiarelli. Daniel Sered and Nikita Oliver on America's Nightmare of Mass Incarceration, as well as two more of our Sterling Jazz Concerts live from our forum co-produced with Earshot Jazz. One's a night devoted to Thelonious Monk, the other an album release party for local Latin jazz band Duende Libre. Uh, also visit our media library uh, for hundreds of events from the recent and even distant past. Town Hall's work is made possible through the support of individuals and institutional donors. Our arts and culture programming uh, is supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is fundamentally a member supported organization. And we wanna thank all of our members watching tonight. We truly would not be able to, uh, to pull it off without you. On that note, Town Hall and nonprofit, the nonprofit community at large are under significant strain with the recent wave of event cancellations. We hope you'll consider extending your generosity um, in this difficult time uh, by using the donate button at the bottom of your screen or by becoming a member. You can make a donation online or text 44321 to give. On a related note, if you're interested in supporting local independent bookstores right now by purchasing a copy of the book being presented tonight, and you will want to, it's gorgeous, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through LA Bay Book Company. Um, that's all I need to say about that. Aaron Barber Strain writes and teaches about food politics, immigration, political economy, and the US-Mexico border. Professor of politics at Whitman College, he has published extensively in academic journals in the US and Mexico, and his writing for civilians has appeared in The Believer, The Chronicle of Higher Education Review, Salon, Gastronomica, and The Huffington Post. He's appeared on numerous national and regional NPR programs and been featured in publications as varied as The New York Times, FoxNews.com, and Süddeutsche Zeitung Magazine and other media. His books include 2007's Intimate Enemies, Landowners, Power, and Violence in Chiapas, and White Bread, A Social History of the Store-Bought Loaf from 2012. His latest book, The Death and Life, Life of Aida Hernandez, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Aaron Bobro Strain. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Ware. And uh, thank you also to, to Candace in the background um, uh, doing the organizational work. I really appreciate your, your help. And, um, and thank you all. Uh, for spending some time here tonight thinking about the US-Mexico border and about Ida. Um, there is so much going on right now and so many urgent issues that demand uh, our attention. And um, that is also true for the US-Mexico border um, where we are in day 485 of the so-called officially declared a na a national emergency on the US-Mexico border declared by Trump. And we really know that the, the humanitarian crisis on the border, largely almost exclusively created by US policies, way predates that declaration as well. And um, so as, as COVID and Black Lives Matter are, are drawing really rightful and crucial uh, attention right now, um, the situation for vulnerable people on the US-Mexico border in immigration detention um, and in the immigration legal system is getting much worse every day right now. Um, usually I spend a little bit of time at the beginning of my talk um, updating folks about the current status of, of immigration and border politics. Um, today I'm gonna do things a little bit differently. Uh, I think I will uh, just dive into talking about the book for a while um, and its context. Um, 
And then at the end, um, I will spend a little bit of time talking about um, the current state uh, and what we're seeing just in this past week um, around the border and immigration. Um, and also uh, taking a moment to reflect also on um, the ways in which anti-Blackness um, has been driving immigration debates and immigration policy uh, in our country for a very long time uh, in ways that often don't get um, discussed. Um, so um, this book, uh, The Death and Life of Aida Hernandez, A Border Story, um, it really emerged out of, of years uh, spent studying and teaching about immigration in the U.S.-Mexico border at Whitman uh, College. Um, it uh, emerged out of my own involvement in immigrant rights uh, organizing here in Washington state. Um, but really, uh, it, it mostly grows out of uh, years I spent working on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and so that's where I want to dive in today. Um, we're going to open on the border. It's 2008. Uh, we are on the border. Twelve years ago, perched between the United States and Mexico, between life and death, and a Mexican ambulance is speeding towards the port of entry uh, and Arizona. And in that ambulance, Ida's face is swollen and purple. Her arms are torn. Uh, she is bleeding from nine stab wounds in the torso and stomach. And the ambulance is racing along the, the latest border wall. Agua Prieta, where Ida was born, uh, is on the left. And Douglas, Arizona, where Ida has lived from age eight until age 20, when just a month earlier, uh, a tiny mishap uh, led to her deportation. Um, that's on the right. Uh, and these two towns have been so closely intertwined for so long that some people call them Dogla Prieta, one community united, not divided by a border. Um, language, families, culture, commerce, government, all that has blurred the border every day for as long as there has been uh, a town there. Um, residents not much older than Ida uh, talk fondly about summer days when they would play baseball games where home plate uh, would be in the United States uh, and the outfield was in Mexico. But it's 2008 now and 15 years of bipartisan border hardening has driven a wedge between those two communities. Um, emergency medical transfers across the border though are still routine. Uh, unless something goes wrong. And right now, Francisco Jone, a Douglas, Arizona paramedic, watches as everything goes wrong. Uh, as the Mexican ambulance pulls into the port of entry, officers surround Ida's gurney, refusing to let her pass. Family members stream in from both sides of the border, arguing with officials. And someone knocks into the gurney, and suddenly Ida shrieks awake. Please, I have a US citizen son, let me pass. And there's a stunned silence and Sunday shoppers crossing back to Mexico from the Walmart in Arizona stop to stare. And the paramedic sees his chance and whisks Ida out of one of the most heavily secured spaces in the US Southwest. A little bit later, uh, the helicopter Arizona Lifeline 2 lifts off from the J.C. Penney's parking lot and sets a course to a hospital in Tucson. And as it rises, it, it first sails over black copper slag heaps that are a, a physical reminder of a more prosperous pass for this area. And then it skims over high-tech surveillance towers and what at the time was the country's largest border patrol station and it keeps going higher, and then it soars past the last highway immigration checkpoint and breaks free of the border. And the paramedic looks down at his clipboard and he reads Ida's name for the first time. And he's done all that he can do for her, he thinks, but Ida Hernandez is not going to make it. She does survive, um, and I, I, I won't 
spoil, uh, I won't give away what happens, um, but weeks later, uh, she returns home to her mother's house in Douglas, Arizona, and she is sutured and stitched and bent over by pain that goes far beyond phys the physical in ways that she is only beginning to understand. And she kneels down and she holds her four-year-old son as tight as her wounds allow her. And she looks at him in the eyes and she says, Gabriel, I promise I will never leave you again. And that's when the hardest part of Ida's story begins. Because this is a book about the border we've made, about trauma, uh, and the courageous struggles of young immigrants fighting for survival uh, and justice on that border. Um, and it centers primarily on the story of Ida Hernandez. Uh, most of it play takes place while uh, Ida is in her teens, late teens, early 20s, and really kind of struggling to do normal stuff. Um, you know, um, pass algebra and um, watching friends on TV and dreaming of a dance scholarship and uh, imagining a day when she can leave her small town and go live in New York City, um, maybe drinking a little too much with her sisters um, and, and also coming to terms with her bisexuality. Uh, but she is growing up undocumented in Douglas during the 1990s and the 2000s, just as policies that are crafted really far from the border with little grounding in the day-to-day -day life on the border or the realities of actual migration and come crashing down on this town, placing Douglas at the center of the storm of US immigration debates for the next 20 years. Um, and very quickly, turning Douglas into one of the most heavily policed small towns in the United States. Ida is also growing up poor, uh, which brings us to a, a larger US story uh, underpinning this border story. Uh, and this part is maybe not uh, entirely intuitive to folks who look at the border from a distance um, and see the border as mainly just a backdrop for immigration dramas. Um, but for most of its history, Douglas, Arizona uh, was less of a border town um, than it was a home to a vibrant copper industry um, championed by organized, unionized Mexican-American workers. Um, and that dynamic of organized labor and the copper industry gave this town its sense of place in the world, its sense of purpose. I mean, it was Mexican Americans from Douglas um, who won a key 1941 uh, Supreme Court uh, ruling, for example, um, that really uh, set the stage for, created a foundation for the post-war rise of organized labor in the United States. But by 1987, the year of Ida's birth, Phelps Dodge Mining Company, uh, inspired by Reagan era anti-union campaigns, shut down its Douglas operations and moved to less uh, union friendly lands. The bad air cleared, the good air, dis the good jobs disappeared uh, and Douglas has never been the same. And as in so many other communities of color around the country, deindustrialization and the disinvestment that followed in this Mexican-American community uh, was not met with elegies um, or calls for empathy. Um, they were met with militarized policing and incarceration, albeit with uh, a unique border twist. Um, in the space of Ida's childhood, Douglas goes from being a copper company town to being a homeland security company town from smokestacks to surveillance towers. And so growing up poor and undocumented in this context caused Ida's first death. And what I mean by that is a social death. Uh, Ida was fully part of her community, an active member, an active maker of her community uh, in every way, yet she was denied real formal membership in that community. She was a citizen without citizenship. Um, and that 
meant that she would be cut off from rights and opportunities that should have been hers. And because of that, we know that she is going to pay a, a very high and violent price for making the small kinds of everyday mistakes that uh, anyone growing up anywhere would make. Ida has to fight for her life literally several more times in the book um, after the scene that I introduced um, just now. But the real struggle, um, the real suspense at the heart of this story is about a young woman who is risking everything to see if she can get from that place of social death to a place where she isn't just surviving the world we have made on the US-Mexico border, but she is thriving. Uh, truly alive. And there's there's lots of spoilers and twists in the book. Um, I, I won't tell too much of the story tonight. Um, I don't want to give away too much. Um, today I'll mostly talk about where the book came from um, or how it came about and, and talk about a few of the conclusions that I think uh, we can draw from this story. Um, so in terms of myself, uh, I first went to the US-Mexico border in the fall of 1993. Um, to work. And I worked there uh, for what turned out to be four years. Um, it was a short time, relatively speaking. Um, I mean, it was deeply formative on many different levels. And I, I kept returning to the border as a researcher, as a teacher, as a volunteer, over and over again, and, and, and cultivating a deep connection to the border over decades. Um, but that fall of 1993 uh, was a formative moment, not just for me as the first time I, I went to the border, but for the border itself. It was a pivotal time for the border because unbeknownst to all of us back then, a new approach to border security was being experimented with and tested out in El Paso, Texas, right at that moment. And it would end up becoming the single-minded center of our entire approach to border enforcement, and arguably to immigration ever since. By a fluke, uh, I actually happened to be in El Paso the week it rolled out in September of 1993. Uh, and basically, it started like this. Um, following a Clinton-era policy blueprint, um, the local Border Patrol sector chief, Silvestre Reyes, pulled his agents off of mobile patrol and simply just lined them up one after another um, along the, the busiest, uh, most crossed, easiest to cross part of the urban El Paso Juarez border. Um, and the idea was that by completely shutting down the relatively easy to cross urban parts of the border, uh, first with agents lined up and then with walls, that that would force migrants out into the more dangerous uh, and deadly uh, terrain of deserts and mountains outside of town. And he figured uh, that this would make border crossing more dangerous, um, that would make it more expensive, um, and that fewer people would do it. Uh, and this strategy became known as prevention through deterrence. Um, and this was the government deliberately weaponizing the desert in the service of deadly deterrence. Uh, a government report actually from that time says that an early sign of success of this program would be increasing deaths on the U.S.-Mexico border. Over the next 27 years, we would see the government deploy many new weapons of deterrence, although we didn't call them that. So the Border Patrol uh, slashing water bottles left by humanitarian groups in the desert, kids dying in cages, withholding vaccines from people in immigration detention, deporting women alone uh, at 3 a.m. Uh, to strange, unfamiliar cities, harassing people uh, trying to make legal asylum claims, uh, the heaping of criminal punishments upon civil immigration matters. When you see that, that seemingly overwhelming jumble of, of hatred and cruelty in the news, when you see those things, know that they're not aberrations. They're not the work of bad apples. They're not the simply artifacts of the Trump administration. 
They are the result of a 27-year-long bipartisan strategy designed to make border crossing more dangerous and more cruel, supposedly to deter migration. One of the themes that runs through this book um, is that prevention through deterrence has weaponized violence against women, um, just as it has weaponized uh, the desert. Uh, and this, not, this is not to say that uh, women experience more gender violence in border communities. That's not at all clear, no matter how much Trump talks about rapists and murderers. Um, and certainly not all violence against women arises uh, from immigration enforcement on the border. What I mean is that our approach to immigration enforcement knowingly cultivates and benefits from heightened vulnerability to gender violence. And to unpack that a little bit, we could say that like, this can take really uh, almost banal everyday forms. Uh, for example, several times in the book, um, different abusive men um, tell women, sure, go ahead, call the police, do it. Um, but you know that in this town, the, bo the border patrol also listens to the police frequency and they'll come. And so I'll get a night in jail or a slap on the wrist, but you'll get deported. You'll lose your kids. That was the threat. Um, this can also be quite blunt. Um, I suspect that a few people out there um, have probably watched maybe Narcos on Netflix or the Sicario of movies, um, that genre. And to watch that genre uh, of TV or film, you kind of get the impression that, that violent cartels uh, exploiting and preying on women uh, in the borderlands were the enemies of the US government, right? Um, but in fact, if you think about it through the strict logic of prevention through deterrence, a strategy designed to make border crossing more dangerous, uh, those cartels are our allies. Uh, we've outsourced some of the worst violence of prevention through deterrence to cartels. Um, and then we act shocked by their savagery. So remember that I guess the way we could sum this up is to say that the border is not broken. It is operating more or less as intended. Uh, and that is the problem that we need to confront. So back in the 1990s, uh, the strategy spread quickly. Uh, it really clicked instantly with uh, Clinton's desire to take a playbook from the Republicans' tough on crime dog whistle playbook. Um, and it turned out that ever more spectacular, uh, ever more expensive forms of deterrence uh, had bipartisan political appeal. And to just give you a sense of the magnitude of this, um, I calculated for the book that um, we have spent the inflation adjusted equivalent of two Marshall plans for the reconstruction of Europe after World War II on deterrence-focused immigration enforcement since the strategy rolled out. And of course, none of this achieved its stated goal. Um, deterrence does a lot of things politically, economically in our country. Um, it's productive for many people, for many companies, politicians, institutions, uh, but we, we have good uh, research and experience now, 27 years of it, that shows that it doesn't actually deter people from migrating. Instead, by the late 1990s, what it had done was it had funneled a continent's worth of migration from Texas, from California, straight into Southern Arizona uh, and the border's most deadly terrain. And one of the very first places where this strategy came crashing down in the summer of 1997, uh, was the small twin border communities of Douglas, Arizona, and Agua Prieta, Sonora, where Ida was growing up, and where most of this book is set. And people reeled as politicians, media, right-wing militias, uh, and migrants descended on the town. Um, they chafed against the militarization of daily life and the imposition of new divides between their community. 
Um, but they had also come to depend on border security and border insecurity spending um, as an economic lifeblood in key ways. By 2014, one in seven employed adult men in Douglas worked for law enforcement. And so in this period, the period of Ida's youth, a vast border security industrial complex takes shape. Um, and you know, there are, we, there are now critiques of that border industrial security complex or border security industrial complex, I guess is the, the better way of saying it. Um, and there's a lot of talk, for example, about private prison companies, rightfully so. Um, and maybe sometimes uh, activists will talk about the Amazons and the Boeings, companies that profit from uh, border crises. Um, but this affects our society in a much broader way. Um, when we talk about the border security industrial complex, we need to also include things like, you know, the Douglas, Arizona police budget um, that relies on Department of Homeland Security um, grants. Um, uh, something like Yakima, the Yakima uh, airport in eastern Washington, where the rural airport generates important revenue needed to keep that airport open um, by allowing itself to be used as one of the main hubs for ICE deportation flights uh, in the Northwest ever since King County um, denied uh, ICE access to um, the county airport. It's also this military or this border security industrial complex is also the Mexican-American kid from Douglas High um, who looks around her deindustrialized, disinvested town and sees Border Patrol as the only uh, job that has benefits um, and a sense of purpose left in the town. So along with critiquing private, profit, uh, private prison companies or the Amazons and Boeings, we also need to talk about the way that a whole diverse way of life um, has taken shape um, that depends on permanent border crisis. Not fixing the border, um, but we have a whole range of communities, politicians and institutions and companies that have a stake in maintaining a permanent border crisis. So back in January of 2014, uh, I went to Douglas and Agua Prieta to try to understand how people were grappling with um, that and how they were living their lives across these hardened divides. And early in the process of my research, uh, um, this, a woman named Rosy Mendoza became uh, really one of my key guides to Douglas uh, and, and the community. And I know uh, so ho hopefully some folks in the audience have read the book and, and you know, she is a badass, formerly undocumented social worker uh, who works with victims of domestic and sexual violence on the border. And actually her story, her life story figures heavily in the book as well um, and has some of its own chapters. Uh, but she connected Ida and me uh, and she encouraged Ida to tell her story. It took a while for us to, to finally meet. Um, there's a funny little uh, story about how we did finally meet um, in the book. Um, but suffice it to say that uh, Ida and I met on a wintry day uh, and we met in the 10th Street Park and we sat there uh, next to the fountain and Ida, told her story. And I had not planned at all to write a book about one person uh, and much less to place violence against women at the heart of a border book. But I knew almost immediately after talking uh, with Ida that she had a powerful message for all of us who look at the border and immigration from a more privileged position and that our current approach to border security couldn't be understood separately from the many ways it makes women's lives less secure and more exposed to violence. And I mean, Ida's story left me shaking that day and it still does. Um, it's filled with such intense pain and suffering. Um, but the thing that really left me shaking on that day in 2014 um, was not the pain. It was the fierce pride that 
uh, she conveyed as she told her story. Uh, she exuded this kind of brio and wit and power that comes from having survived by the seat of her pants time and time again, and having fought against all the odds uh, for a place for herself and her son in the United States. And so I realized that amid all that suffering was a message that the sheer act of surviving the world we have made on the border is itself a form of dignity and worth that is as valuable uh, as any privileged person's achievements. And that, that really hit me. And um, the writer, Hector Tobar, uh, who I, I really uh, respect and appreciate his work so much, um, he talks about the way uh, in, in a piece he's written about critiquing immigration porn in journalism, what he calls immigration porn in journalism. And he talks about that way that that spirit of agency and wit and brio is often left out of reporting that portrays immigrants as passive victim props for tragic border tales. Um, and I, I heard uh, the brio and the wit and the agency in Ida's story and wanted to convey that spirit. And of course, the idea of having someone write a book about you wouldn't necessarily click with a lot of people, um, but it did uh, with Ida. And we talked about the possibility for several months. Um, and Ida was really firm through the whole process. Um, she said, Aaron, I have dealt with the worst possible people you can imagine already, and they did not stop me. And telling my story is a way to turn all of the suffering that I've been through into something that can reach people uh, and make a difference. So from there, uh, really the hard work of research began um, and getting a, a story that's as sensitive uh, and difficult like this um, right um, meant doing many hours of, of interviews with Ida, of course, her family, her friends, and, and many other people whose lives cross paths with hers. Um, it meant cross-checking those accounts with hundreds of pages of school and court and immigration and medical uh, and other records. It meant listening to court recordings, talking with uh, attorneys and physicians and law enforcement and community leaders and psychologists um, to verify the plausibility of the kinds of stories um, I was hearing. Uh, it also meant um, doing all kinds of things to get the, the details as right as possible. Um, for example, I remember a time with, um, uh, well, Ida, it, it is a bit of a spoiler, but Ida is living in New York City right now. She did make it to New York City. Um, uh, and she was on her phone in New York City. I'm on my f uh, computer in Walla Walla, and we are looking at um, uh, uh, Google Street View uh, um, <laughs> Uh, visions of Douglas, Arizona, and we're like, is that the tree we're talking about here, or is that the tree over there we are talking about? Um, and doing things like w Ida and I watching um, Chola makeup uh, vi tutorial videos together on YouTube so I could uh, get those details right. Um, things that I would not have expected. Coming into this project uh, as, a, as a white man, a straight white man, um, even as one with experience, uh, working on the border and doing immigrant rights work. Um, I knew that the risk of me missing things, of misunderstanding, of, of exploiting people's stories was, was real. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about um, how to do or whether a, a project like this could be done uh, ethically by me. Um, and, and you know, in the end, it was really discussions with Ida that, that moved us forward. Um, but really trying to put that into practice in, the, in an ethical way meant carefully going over drafts with Ida um, throughout the process, uh, making the project as collaborative as possible, um, having her shape the narrative, um, getting drafts to her family and, and many other people who appear in the book and having uh, those uh, folks from the border shape the story. It also meant throughout the whole life of the project engaging with um, scholars and activists of color um, people um, who would understand, yes, the, the possible benefits of a project like this, but also the risks 
of a project like this in a really immediate way. Uh, and a question I, I often pose to folks in those conversations was, was should I publish this? Um, and um, knowing that the answer could easily be no. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's not for me to say whether, uh, you know, I, I navigated these traps uh, well, um, but the feedback and the critique I received uh, and the encouragement I, I received from that, those, um, those engagements, that, that dialogue working together um, really shaped the book. Um, over time, the story uh, and the research expanded um, to include other people um, whose lives intersected with Ida's. Um, there's Rosi, who I already mentioned. Um, there's Alvaro, who is a, a self-described Chicano death metal bassist uh, and addict um, who says that he can calm other people, just not himself. Um, <laughs> there's Raul, who's a really complicated um, hero of Mexico's 1960s guerrilla movement, whose life intersects with Ida in a really important way. Um, and there's Emma, an Ecuadorian uh, LGBTQ activist in the US um, who plays a key role in this story as well. But it, throughout, it remains rooted in uh, Ida's memories, um, told by me, surrounded by lots of additional research. Um, and so two years into the project, uh, Ida and I agreed that we would split proceeds from the book in three ways. Um, a third for her, um, a third to fund an organization working with victims of domestic and sexual violence on the border, um, and a third to me to cover the costs of research and writing and fact checkers um, and, and book travel. Um, and in the course of this, uh, whenever we met, I made three commitments to Ida. One is that she could end the project at any time, um, no matter how long, how far along we were. Second is that she would read drafts throughout the process and it would be collaborative. And if she ever revealed something um, in an interview that in retrospect she decided uh, was too personal or embarrassing, um, we could uh, take that out. Um, in the end, we didn't end up taking anything out for that reason. Um, and third, that I would do my best um, to portray her not as a demon um, or as a saint, but as a real complex, flawed, brilliant person. Uh, and that her story would matter in itself, not just as an illustration um, for a set of political arguments. Um, and that last piece was very important for me um, as a writer um, to make sure that Ida's story mattered, um, that it wasn't just me looking for a, a way to illustrate arguments. Um, it was central to the ethics of the project. It was central to the literary uh, endeavor as well. How do you tell a powerful, complex story? Um, and also it's central to the politics of the book. And if there's one thing that I hope folks will take out of this book, it's this. And that is that it is impossible in the United States to overstate how much our immigration debates, um, even our sense of ourselves as a nation of immigrants, um, turns on this, this impossible binary between the the, the flawless, high achieving, innocent, uh, quote unquote, good immigrant who maybe deserves sympathy and rights. And on the other hand, um, the supposedly bad criminal alien who deserves all the punishment uh, she gets. As Rosy Mendoza, uh, who I've mentioned, uh, often tells Ida, Ida, humans make mistakes, immigrants can't. But Ida's account did not uh, disavow her imperfect, her imperfect past at all um, or solicit my pity. Uh, it just burned with uh, sufficiency. Um, and if you follow the threads of Ida's death, the one she survived, and her life, the one she is still fighting for, um, you will see that they challenge those of us who look at immigration and the border from a privileged position to recognize that undocumented immigrants whose messy human lives don't fit into that externally imposed good, bad binary are still deeply part of their communities. And they are active members and makers of their communities, regardless of whether they fit external images of perfection um, or innocence or high achievement. Um, and they should be legally 
recognized as such. Okay, um, before I end, um, instead of reading, which I will often do at an event like this, I haven't read uh, at, over a virtual event. Um, I just wanna talk about two passing concerns um, right now that relate to the book. Um, the first is, is not something that I'm a particular expert in, um, but it, it relates, it, it draws out of uh, the book really directly and is very important right now. Um, and it's about the relationship between immigration politics and anti-blackness. And I've, I've critiqued um, the good immigrant, bad immigrant binary uh, of deservingness and worth um, in the book because it's a foundational belief of our country. Um, and it's a belief that condemns people like Ida to death every day. Um, it's also important to note though, that that good, bad binary historically has been built uh, in large part on anti-blackness. And whether it was the Irish uh, in the 1800s um, or Latinx immigrants today, one of the ways that people have historically positioned themselves as worthy quote unquote good immigrants um, was by distancing themselves from images of supposedly lazy or criminal um, blackness and claiming a higher position in the United States' racist hierarchies. Uh, even the slogan, we're not criminals, um, which is so crucial in immigrant rights movements right now as a way of resisting the criminalization, particularly of Latinx um, folks, um, uh, it, it still notably throws people like Ida under the bus. Um, and it also can really end up that we're different, we're not criminals like them, uh, ends up reinforcing images of black criminality. Um, so thinking about how we can have a reckoning about that piece of the immigration story. And for black immigrants um, who are facing both racist nativism and anti-black policing, um, this binary is even, more impossible, um, which is perhaps one of the explanations why um, black immigrants, both documented and undocumented, are detained and deported at disproportionately higher levels um, than uh, Latinx or Asians or other uh, folks in our immigration system. Um, and there's a lot more um, we could talk about in this realm. Um, I think it's worth noting that the country's very first citizenship laws in 1790, that would kind of become the precursor of immigration law, was designed to deny naturalized citizenship to black and indigenous people. Uh, and that uh, was formative in our immigration legal system for, for decades, um, well, for century uh, or more after that. Um, we also see this in other moments like the 1990s, um, when the massive expansion of immigration detention that we're seeing right now um, and grappling with right now um, was launched um, because that in incredible expansion of immigration detention, which had largely kind of fallen in abeyance into disuse um, in the in the mid uh, 20th century, um, was, was not created uh, to deal with undocumented Latin American migrants on the Southern border, as many people think, um, but rather to control black refugees um, in the Caribbean. Haitians and Afro-Cubans, um, and it was in the Caribbean on black bodies that our current Attorney General William Barr, who was then Attorney General for George H.W. Bush, forged the model of indefinite, deadly, and unaccountable immigration detention um, that we see today. Um, only later did that get extended to folks on the southern border. So again, I, this is not something I'm a particular expert on, but it's an important reckoning to have in general and within the immigrant rights movement. Um, I strongly suggest, encourage people to um, check out the Undocu Black Network um, to learn more about their activism. Um, and in question and answers, there's some academic books I can recommend if folks are interested in well as well. And then last to end, um, I'll be briefer so we can get to the questions on this. It's just to alert folks, if you're not already seeing this and recognize that there are many other things going on right now, please pay attention to the fact that the Trump administration is using the cover of COVID-19 to push through a whole series of regulations and rules designed to essentially entirely dismantle the US asylum system. 
It has been poking away at the US asylum system for several years now in small ways. Um, it's typically those efforts um, haven't been able to gain any legislative traction and the rules and regulations have been blocked in the courts because they're unconstitutional and illegal. Um, but under the co cover of COVID, there's a real possibility that he might be able to achieve this long uh, dreamed of policy goal of dismantling the entire uh, asylum system. And there's two examples of this. First is the a March um, CDC rule, largely missed by the press, um, that made it possible for the United States to summarily deport um, Central American asylum seekers, folks with credible legal claims to asylum on the border, um, without any possibility of a hearing, of legal counsel, of appeal, even without a chance to state their claim um, for asylum. Um, and that uh, ruling has been, uh, which is supposedly to protect public health, um, has been used to deport around 20,000 people already since March um, without any hearing, legal counsel, or appeal. Um, and then last week, after picking at the asylum system for years, um, a whole slate of new rules was proposed. I'm still trying to fully understand them. Um, but experts say that they will create so many obstacles for asylum seekers um, that will eff that effectively mean the end of asylum law in the United States. Um, again, this has been a long-term goal of the Trump administration. Its efforts have been blocked by the legislature, by courts. Um, now, in the name supposedly of protecting public health, um, there's a possibility um, that they may succeed um, and we need to pay attention to that um, the rules uh, proposed this last week uh, are particularly egregious in terms of targeting the particular kinds of claims that Central American asylum seekers would make and also that women fleeing gender violence would make. In fact, some of the very legal protections that Ida relies on in the book um, would be eliminated by this new, uh, or Ida relies on in her life. Um, um, the, the key protection she needs uh, in the story um, would be um, possibly eliminated by these new rules. Um, so please, uh, I know there's a lot going on, but uh, make yourself aware of, of those rules um, and the efforts to, um, to contest and challenge them. All right, I'll stop there. Um, hopefully there'll be some, uh, some questions. Uh, sometimes I know it's a little bit difficult to ask questions over Zoom, but uh, I am happy to, to stick around and, and chat with folks. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, this is fantastic. And you've done a beautiful job <clears throat> both giving us a rich presentation and leaving so many questions unanswered that we all have to rush out and buy the book. Sure. Really well done. I, I have a few things and they're kind of scattershot before we um, roll over to the questions that are starting to sort of bubble up. And yep. by the way, now is the time to formulate if you've been if, if uh, you've been thinking of something, use this time while I'm tap dancing to, yep. uh, to pose. So, um, I've, I've sort of noticed the trend that you're describing, or it's not a trend, but the, the strategy of sort of trying a, a, fresh, a fresh assault on border policy under the cover of COVID. Yeah. Um, why do you think um, uh, uh, Lopez Obrador um, and the Mexican government, and from a layperson's perspective, seem to be sort of willingly going along with this right now? What's, what's right. in it for Mexico? Hmm. That's a great question, and I really appreciate you asking that because a lot of times, uh, particularly among the kind of liberal or the activist left, you know, the focus rightly has been on um, U.S. policies and the way the U.S. is making the border unlivable um, uh, and violent. Um, I think it's also really re important to recognize that in our present day moment, geopolitical borders are less and less divides between separate sovereign nations as they are sites where the kind of uh, political elites and economic elites of different countries collaborate to control the movements of, of poor people. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mentioned Raul uh, in the book, um, who is this, yeah, he's a main character in the book, um, and he's a hero of Mexico's guerrilla movement in the 60s. And uh, when I learned that his life had intersected with Ida's in an important way. In fact, he's Ida's father. Um, yeah, 
it was it was it was an amazing opportunity to bring in the struggles for justice in Mexico uh, and bring in all the ways in which Mexico is also participating in the militarization of the U.S. Mexico border. Um, and in terms of Lopez Obrador, the current president, I mean, it's really striking. He's a leftist populist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but what's 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 really becoming clear in recent months is that the the populist part trumps the leftist part. Yeah. Um, and that there's many similarities between uh, him and, and Trump on, on a whole range of issues. Um, one of them being the kind of heightened levels of anti-immigrant sentiment um, within Mexico, right? Uh, anti-immigrant uh, anti sentiment against Central Americans who are making the extremely dangerous journey across the, the border. Another character, Emma, in the story um, is an Ecuadorian uh, asylum seeker um, who uh, her journey involves a flight from Quito to uh, Honduras, and then the, that dangerous long journey through Central America and then up through Mexico. So you get to you get to see uh, and understand some piece of the the dangerous um, the ways in which Mexico um, has uh, militarized the U.S. Mexico border. Uh, and then you can also talk about a lot of the violence having to do with the kind of um, both the violence people are fleeing in Central America and the violence they're experiencing in Mexico. Um, are related to the U.S. pushed for U.S. supported, U.S. funded so-called war on drugs. And right. if you talk to Central American activists today, they will say, um, if you want to know why we're here on the border right now, it's because you're there uh, in Central America um, making a mess of things with the war on drugs. Um, how, uh, and, and I'm not leapfrogging to, is it November 9th? The day after the upcoming election, when you know there's a chance we'll have different leadership, but how easily can this sort of current advance by um, the administration either be undone by um, a subsequent administration or or be forestalled by the courts in the meantime? Yeah. You know, that's great. Uh, good question. Uh, this is a place where I actually have a little bit of optimism, and it it really. It's physically difficult to say that at this moment um, that I have optimism around this, this, particularly because of this rollout of new asylum policies, rules and regulations that are so um, uh, just incredibly sweeping. Um, but um, the fact is that during Trump's administration, support for undocumented people has grown. If you look at the polling, more people support undocumented people, support a pathway to legal citizenship now than they did um, before Trump. Um, and a part of that is a reaction to Trump. A lot of it is the work of young immigrant rights activists uh, mm -hmm. in this country who are fighting a, a, cult, a war on many different cultural fronts to kind of change uh, un understandings of, of immigrants. Um, uh, but it's, it's really marked. Uh, and that's hopeful. Um, and because of that, and because of the resistance of immigrant rights groups and particularly young immigrant uh, rights activists, um, Trump has been unable to turn any of the things, um, any of his policy agenda into law. Right. None of it has been legislated. It's been achieved through executive action, mm -hmm. through rules, um, through uh, guidance to, um, uh, law enforcement and how to enforce particular laws through uh, regulations that define particular words in certain ways for immigration judges. Um, all of that can be rolled back um, much more easily than, um, uh, than legislative change. Um, so that's, that's something to think about. And one of the first tasks, if um, if there is a different administration, will be to pressure that administration to to get the ball rolling on undoing that. But it's really, I mean, you've got the sense that you know um, Stephen Miller and and others in the administration have been trying to get these rules changed in so many different pieces of the system that it's going to be difficult to undo that. And that is yeah. true. Um, and you get the sense now that they're like, oh, the election is coming up. We better get as many of these changed as possible uh, as right. fast as we can. Right. Um, I, I wonder if in the way that the sort of cumulative, the attention finally um, that there's finally a breakthrough moment around um, the Black Lives Matter movement and around racial equity. Um, 
uh, driven by the sort of inescapable witness of that event. I, I, I wonder if um, the a lot of the transformation in public thought around this issue that you're describing, I mean, this administration, and I'm as speaking as a private citizen, I'm allowed to say this, this administration has visited so many indignities and traumas on this country, but it's, it's hard to remember and reach back to just, was it two years ago when it was all about, you know, what we were doing at the border and uh, incarceration of children and the, those traumatizing images um, that, and I, so I wonder, do you think that, um, is, it, is it our repellence towards Trump or was there a moment when the reporting and the, sto the, the storytelling like yours made vivid um, and human um, what had been previously just sort of, you know, Democrat, Republican, back and forth, like tennis match sort of policy BS, finally, there were people at the center of the story. Um, what do you what do you attribute this sort of change in um, in American perspective to? I guess. Yeah. I mean, and obviously, there's a long way to go on this. I mean, we haven't seen a, a full change. In, no, in, not a full in any regard. regard. Um, uh, you know, I think that uh, you know, as much as I'd like to think that it was, you know, narratives and, and reporting and books like this, um, the bulk of the shift has come from immigrant rights activists, particularly young undocumented people putting their lives on the line, um, and mobilizing, um, and getting out in the streets, um, and confronting, um, this system. Uh, I think that's been, there's been, you know, that's been happening for a long time, but there's been a, a big upsurge of that. Um, you know, in terms, I think it's also important um, to remember that while we can point to a lot of hor horrific things that Trump has done, um, and he has done horrific things in immigration. And just again, to keep focusing on these new asylum rules, um, I think in many ways, these are worse than children in cages and family separation, because what they actually do, at least those were visible to the press, visible to activists, visible to attorneys who could go and visit um, folks in those cages. Um, right now, by giving these summary powers to just deport and exclude and not even take asylum claims, um, we're making all of that um, violence invisible. Right, we're turning people back to Mexico, back to uh, Central America, and we won't see the violence will be much more distant from our view um, because of these rules than it would be if it were in our face in a cage in in southern Texas. Um, so I think we've got to keep an eye on that. Uh, but remember also that um, Trump didn't create this, um, and getting rid of Trump isn't going to fix it. Isn't going to fix uh, it. And you know, uh, Clinton. Um, really, Bill Clinton, the President Clinton, uh, bears a huge amount of, of the blame for the emergence of this system. It's been a bipartisan um, effort effort for, for 27 years. Yeah. I'm going to pose two more quick questions and, and invite people to, to put a, more, a couple more in, if you would. Um, uh, how was, once you invited Ida in as a collaborator, um, if you will, rather than yeah. a subject, which is a really sort of powerful change, I bet for you as a researcher and as a writer, um, how how um, how willing was she to tell every side of her story, to to be willing to be candid about her mistakes and flaws yeah. as well? Like, talk to me a little bit about that about that interaction yeah. and how she how willingly she entered into that compact. Right. I mean, first on that kind of collaborative uh, relationship um, where, you know, there is the reciprocity in terms of um, the proceeds of the book and the kind of the way in which, you know, saying like giving her veto power over parts of the in the story. But none of that is normal within journalism. No, <laughs> I think that makes uh, some journalists uh, uncomfortable. Um, but we're from the world of ethnography and activism that I come out of. Um, as opposed to journalism, that's much more a kind of normal and uh, assumed um, uh, way that you try to navigate research ethics. Um, and the thing that, so that, then to answer your question, you know, the thing that made this book possible was the fact that Ija, Ida um, is just un 
unceasingly courageous about uh, telling her story and believing that telling her story publicly um, can make a difference. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, it didn't happen all at once, right? I mean, that, that, that day uh, in the 10th Street Park by the fountain, you know, the, the version of Ida's story that she told was, you know, a stylized version of her life. Like you would tell a stylized mm -hmm. version of your life if someone sat you down and said, hey, what's up? Um, uh, but over time, over the years, um, uh, four years of collaborating together, um, you know, slowly uh, more and more details of the story came out. And through all that, Ida was unflinching uh, in terms of just recognizing that the the more real, um, the, the more she would kind of tell the, the real story, um, uh, flaws and all, mistakes and all, um, the more powerful it would be. Um, and she is an amazing storyteller. Um, and that's also, you know, one of the things that made the book powerful. No possible. Uh, I'm going to flip over to our questions. Um, and let me start. Uh, and in large part, they they sort of pull your work into uh, into the contemporary frame. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can you talk about what the the end of policing that's being discussed and envisioned yeah. at this moment looks like through an immigration lens? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I will go out publicly and, and say, you know, uh, that we need to abolish ICE and the Border Patrol. Um, and, and through that, um, uh, what we have are these two uh, rogue agencies um, that have been irresponsible with lives. Um, they haven't been able to manage their own money. Uh, and we're talking about organizations to get, give you a sense of the size here. Um, the immigration enforcement budget um, in 2012, when I, I last checked the statistics, and it's only grown since then, um, the, the budget for immigration enforcement was the equivalent of the budget for the FBI, the Secret Service, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the ATF, the US Marshals Service combined oh, with enough left over to run the national park system, right? So let think about that quantity of money yearly every time you hear someone say, oh, we need to double the border patrol, <laughs> right? Uh, we're already talking about um, the largest police force in the United States. Um, for a while, the border patrol CBP, um, which uh, involves both the, the, the people in green uh, that you see uh, on the in between ports of entry and the people in blue that you see in airports and in ports of entry that are both part of CBP. Um, for a while, that was the largest federal police force. Now it's the largest police force uh, in the country. Um, and when you look at their record of, of human rights abuses, when you look at their mismanagement of, of money, when you look at the deep, um, deep systemic corruption um, that's with uh, you find within the agency that the number of people being arrested for drug trafficking and migrant smuggling from within the border patrol. Um, when you there is really no way to reform this agency, um, and it's also the wrong agency for the job. And I think this is where it really connects to a lot of what people are talking about in terms of defunding police. Um, we have hired for 27 years. We have hired um, militarized um, he-men warriors. Um, to be in the border patrol, um, when really what we're dealing with are humanitarian crises um, that involve refugees, um, families, children, um, fleeing violence who have a legal right to claim asylum in the United States. Um, and they confront these militarized he-men warriors. Um, and I've been inter interviewing border patrol agents since the early 1990s, and I've really seen the attitude change um, over time where there's a more and more militarized sense that we are fighting a war, a desperate war for the existence of our nation. Um, uh, as opposed to even in the early 1990s, there was a little bit of cynicism about that Border Patrol mission when I would talk to Border Patrol agents. So there's been a deep militarization of that agency um, and they are just the wrong people um, to be engaged. We need immigration uh, judges, we need uh, social service providers, we need legal aid, we need all kinds of, uh, you know, other kinds of things to engage with the particular kinds of migration we're dealing with now, and we are likely to in, uh, deal with in the future. Um, 
it's not a militarized police force that that is needed. Um, so absolutely, I think that that's a, a, a would be a great example of how to think about, uh, from my perspective, how to, uh, defunding police is really realizing that they're the wrong people um, for this job that we have. Um, uh, and picking up that thread, Megan asks, are there ways for immigration rights advocates to use this current civil rights movement to help build broader empathy for immigrants without co-opting the work of Black Lives Matter organizers? <sighs> Yeah, that I mean, that's a, a really important question, um, and I think you know the and this is you know, you know I'm, I'm hesitant to kind of speak for uh, immigrant rights movements at this point, um, but I I do think you know I've been seeing um, coming from immigrant rights movements um, uh, a real sense of needing to create those alliances. Um, and build alliances across differences um, that can be really powerful um, through solidarity um, and also uh, reckoning with and confronting um, the forms of anti-Blackness that exist within the immigrant rights movement as well. I'm seeing quite a bit of discussion um, of that. So I think those are two um, key things that, that will be really important going forward. And Megan, as a follow-on question, <clears throat> what action items um, uh, would you give audience members who are interested in helping create a more just America for undocumented people? Yeah, I mean, the the ultimate. I mean, the the if you want a uh, the the last eighty years in immigration law history in two seconds, it's that we have been dramatically shrinking the the possibilities for legal migration, particularly from Latin America without dealing at all with the root causes of why people are, are fleeing their home countries uh, and coming to the United States. Um, and so that's going to create flows of migration um, and it's going to create flows of undocumented migration because we've made it impossible for people to, to migrate legally. So any way forward is gonna involve both starting to reckon with um, the root causes of why people are leaving, right? And that Central American activists saying, you know, we're here because you were there, right? That's in Central America, we're talking about 150 years of, of fruit company coups and Cold War proxy battles, you know, the violence that people are fleeing in Honduras really escalated dramatically after the 2009 US-backed coup um, that unseated the democratically elected president of Honduras, uh, right? So dealing with the way we project our power out into the world that drives migration, um, is one piece. Um, and then making, uh, recognizing the fact that undocumented people are part of our communities um, already, they're makers of our communities, uh, and simply having the legal immigration possibility so that they can legalize, right? That, that's the big picture. Um, I think in terms of like more immediate actions you can take um, in Seattle, I really encourage folks to, um, get involved with uh, La Resistencia, which is working on uh, immigration detention down in the Tacoma uh, Immigration Detention Center, uh, the Northwest uh, Detention Center, um, where um, there has been an incredible history of activism and organizing by immigrants in detention, hunger strikes, um, La Resistencia is supporting them, and right now working uh, really desperately um, to, pro uh, to, to get people released from immigration detention um, to avoid a kind of a, a humanitarian public health catastrophe in immigration detention in Tacoma. Um, there's also WISEN, the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network um, that's active in Seattle. Um, uh, that is an excellent organization um, to check out as well. On the east side, um, there's a lot of work folks in Seattle can do to support um, uh, striking um, striking packing house workers um, in Yakima, um, as well as other uh, essential farm workers um, who are really feeling the brunt of, of, um, of, of the COVID crisis. Um, so looking out for those opportunities as well. Um, I was gonna suggest that we will we'll come back afterwards and make sure that the audience has uh, links available to the resources you're Thank suggesting. You. And maybe offline, we'll connect with you about the books that you were referring to that might've come up in the Q&A as well. And okay. we can sort of send people away with um, with further investigation beyond, oh. beyond um, your own book, of course. I'm gonna pose one more quick question to you, which is that 
in the way that you you started out trying to write or believing that you would write a different book mm. and um and essentially ida's voice was um too emphatic too um uh passionate and confident uh to be kind of ignored and to and that she needed to take stage with you uh to to build this book how do you imagine your work um as a researcher as an activist um will be changed by having met her and having mm. having written a book like this that you didn't really expect to yeah <laughs> oh, I mean, that's a huge question um I build it as a quick one, by the way. Yeah. I, I don't know oh, what I'm That's a quick question. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I mean, uh, it just, it really reinforced for me the power of, of narrative as a way of getting to know the world, right? As a researcher, we don't usually think of narrative as how we learn about the world. Uh, it's more about how we communicate what we've learned. Um, but thinking about going into this, as opposed to going into this to create my own argument about the border and then find evidence for that argument, right? That's the more traditional way. Um, by following the narrative, um, it forced me into all of these new areas that I would not have written about, um, whether it was the guerrilla movement in Mexico in the 1960s, um, violence against women on the border, the centrality of violence against women um, to the border security story, um, uh, LGBTQ uh, asylum uh, questions, um, uh, being able to follow uh, narrative into all of these new areas, follow the story into these new areas um, was really powerful for me uh, as an academic and a storyteller. Um, so I think that that is something that I will, I will carry forward um, um, through this. Um, and also kind of thinking of kind of how to how to engage with people um, uh, and do this kind of work in, a, in an ethical way. I, I learned, you know, I'm still learning so much about that every day, um, but it was it was a really powerful learning experience. Aaron, um, the death and life of Ida Hernandez, um, it's it's been acclaimed. Um, you won a pile of awards. I should have mentioned some of them in your bio. I apologize for that. But um, this is um, me pivoting to the audience and suggesting to all of you that um, if you were with us at Town Hall tonight, every single one of you, you know it, you would go to the LA Bay table and pick one up and he would sign it for you. So take that extra step, if you will, and click by the book and learn more about Ida's story, um, especially now that you know that um, uh, she and causes that are dear to her will also be beneficiaries of the purchase. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for, thank for you. continuing to uh, promote not just the book, but her story in the world. And I hope yeah, we uh, get to see you again sometime at Town Hall. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, if you do end up buying the book and reading it, and uh, I'm easy to find on the internet, send me an email. I I respond to those emails. Um, and I also pass messages on to Ida. And a lot of readers have sent really powerful, encouraging messages to her um, that have, um, uh, she has talked about how meaningful that has been um, to her to, to hear from folks who have read the book. So. Fantastic. Uh, all right. Well, thanks so much. Thank you so much. See you again. All right. Thank you. Bye, everybody.